have a little trouble knitting the book um, or building the book as it as it as it were. So um, I'm I'm pretty close, but there may be some subtle changes in what gets pushed to the to the GitHub. Maybe you all can uh, help me through some of those uh, issues, or, or or you've got some ideas. Um, diving into uh, chapter 13 to the transportation use case, um, the authors uh, open with a note, uh, <laughs> the Tobler note, that uh, obviously I, I think in in geospatial use cases we understand that things that are near to one another may be more related to one another than, than distant things. And um, transportation in particular is, uh, is an interesting use case because spatial relationships are, um, they're time relationships and they're, um, they're, they're the cost relationships in, in moving goods and humans around. Um, in this chapter, uh, We'll talk about aerial units with, with the map real quickly, and then desire lines uh, between those aerial units, uh, discussion of nodes, uh, building routes, route networks, and then uh, a mention of agents. All of this is dynamic. Um, so there are resources to look at uh, systems like traffic or water flow where um, what is happening in the world is changing, or there's a capacity maybe in a on a road or a bike path. Um, all of this brings us back to uh, what what we're doing here is modeling. So we're modeling to take on a particular problem or a a specific question, and and maybe looking at before and after to improve the safety or the performance of you know in this case a transport system. Okay. So the specific use case we'll look at here is related to the city of Bristol uh, in the UK and specifically Bristol's uh, uh, way of moving people to and from work, the, the commuting infrastructure. And that includes uh, the bike paths, the rail infrastructure, and in this simplification, the, the roads that, that people used to drive on. When we pull in the Bristol region data set, uh, Bristol itself is highlighted in yellow in this map. Um, when I knitted the book, I, I left it as the static version of the map, but there's a way to, to make an interactive map and zoom in and out. It just makes the, the, uh, makes the book really big. Um, obviously, the questions about the region's transport network really can't be answered just by looking at the area of the city, though. You have to look at all the people who commute into and out of the city. Um, so there's, there's a bounding box of sorts of what's in scope and what's not in scope in the region. Um, they have another data set. Um, TTWAs are travel to work areas. So the regional authorities have established, uh, say, a regional estimation of say, all the zones where it's most likely people will be commuting into and out of the city. Um, even there, there's obviously still some people that will commute out of the zone. So um, those end up not being counted in this study. The data here is generally from uh, OpenStreetMap, which is handy. Um, let's see what else here. And OK, and, and again, travel to work areas are as defined by region authorities. So if it's, if it's another city like um, uh, New York City or uh, Montreal or, or wherever, uh, there's, there's likely a regional body that, that has um, established study areas. So these sorts of uh, models can be made and, and, and shared with, with uh, people who decide policy. So within that travel to work area, 
um, there are zones. Um, maybe a little bit like uh, um, what the authors use is uh, hydrological watersheds. So, so these are individual areas where, for the purposes of this model, we'll assume that the people in that zone are um, uh, almost like homogenous. So there's a certain percentage of, uh, of um, people who use cars or people who travel from one zone to another that we'll model, but, but that zone is counted as a unit. Uh, in our data set, there are 102 travel to work zones. Um, so that's the level of granularity we, we'll, we will be dealing with. The, the data set, though, we're looking at for 102 zones has 2,900 uh, records. And that's simply because uh, people in one zone could travel to uh, that zone itself or any of the other zones. So there's, a, there's an origin column and a destination column. In, in every row of this, this file. And, and recall the, the zones themselves, there are 102. So to join the shape file with the, the, uh, the traffic counts file or the OD file, um, we've got to do some, some grouping. Um, and in this case, if we group by origin, we, and build a picture of where people are going to. Um, for example, for, for this geocode or this zone, um, we've got uh, bicycle trips, um, trips by foot in this census survey, uh, trips by car and trips by train. Um, and, and that file with, um, say with the origin geocodes can be joined with the um, uh, geometries with the Bristol zones. Um, that represents 238,000 uh, 238, trips. Um, the reality is most zones individually have between zero and 4,000 trips originating in one zone and, and, and arriving at some other zone. Um, look at the, the map down here. The dark is the lowest. Um, just an observation here. It, it, it may be that low trip numbers in the outs, outskirts are explained by the fact that people in the suburbs may still leave the region. So they, they may be less densely populated. Well, they're, they're, they're larger, but um, it, it's more likely that people are traveling outside of the study region, as we said before. Um, with this TM shape map, um, we faceted the, the zone of origin of people's trips, so where they're traveling from, and the zone of destination, where they're traveling to. And maybe we can infer from this that in the city centers is where people work, and many people travel from the 102 regions into uh, the city centers for work and then back out. Um, uh, I don't know, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to guess that, but that, that seems to be intuitive from this data set. Okay, so with that data, um, we can begin making some assumptions about a, a model, a, a representation of what's happening here. If we look at the top 10 um, total trips, um, one thing we can observe is this uh, zone, which happens to be a city center zone. It's, it's uh, if we sort by um, total trips here, um, it's, its destination is itself. So this is uh, in in the file. This is a, a an an intrazonal city center. So it, they they did survey people, find out where they go, and and odds are pretty good 
people are walking on foot from where they live to where they work within the same zone. Uh, many of the others in the top 10, uh, the destination zone is this 2003043. So people are traveling from other zones into the city center. So that is a interzonal um, movement. Um, we could make desire lines uh, for these, say, traffic modes um, that reflect where people want to go. <laughs> um, this is ignoring the built infrastructure. It's just uh, w w when they go from zone to zone, where are most of the people or many of the people trying to go? Where's the demand? And uh, this could be also expressed as the portion that are uh, maybe the modes of transportation we're promoting here, uh, healthy modes of transportation. So we've summed the bicycle and foot traffic and divide it by say all of the traffic and we determine a, a proportion that is, that is uh, uh, active modes of transportation. Could also filter out or separate interzonal from intrazonal in our study to, to think about who's, who's traveling from one zone to another. And, and in this modeling for right now, um, they introduce a feature uh, where we can show from two uh, uh, desire lines from centroid to centroid um, using this OD line function, OD two line function. Um, back, I made a top ten here, so. Um, this graphic, which is interesting when it's interactive, um, shows in green down here the zone-to-zone uh, -zone movements of demand lines of the top 10 flows of, of active travel uh, compared to the, this mesh of all the other demand lines from, uh, you know, from, from zone to zone. So the map shows the city center dominates transport patterns, uh, particularly it, with respect to active travel, um, which might suggest that active travel policies should be prioritized there. But perhaps if we got be beyond the top 10, there's, a, there's potential to uh, serve the public with the, their active travel needs in, in other um, you know, in other hubs that are, are just beyond the top 10. Okay, so that modeling's relatively simple. It's just zone to zone. Um, at this point in the transport network, we'll introduce uh, another concept, um, uh, this idea of nodes and and in this case, we're thinking about um, origins and destinations along with any junctions where we, uh, maybe we walk to a train station, we take rail, and then we get off the train and walk to work. Um, it's, it's possible to model the network as ed edges and nodes for multimodal trips. And the authors note here a, a common barrier preventing people from switching away from their cars is, is that um, one leg of the journey may be, may be not possible. Uh, so public transport perhaps can serve the um, active transit by, by uh, facilitating these multimodal trips for people further out from the city center. So this can be modeled. Um, here again, we, we have in our data set in the desire lines, the 
you know, the, the column specifically on train, for example. And, and we can see that, um, well, we could make just, just the, the, uh, uh, the rail piece of that, or even better uh, from the SD planner package, um, we can identify the, uh, say the nearest neighbors components and convert those to multi-line strings to say visualize what are likely or possibly high demand um, multi-mode trips. And so this still uses the, uh, the centroids of the zones. So it's not actually from each person's home or through rail stations. What we end up with here with, with the code is, um, well, in this case, we did load uh, um, dots for the, for the existing rail stations. But what we've modeled here is the original design line, desire lines from those top 10 uh, uh, in the in the in the travel census or transportation census data, the top ten volume uh, are active volume um, um, zones. We've mapped those and their desire lines, and then mapped um, for each of them what are likely the legs uh, from the centroid of that zone to a station that's nearby using nearest neighbors. And then uh, from the station to the destination zone. And if I could zoom in here, then leg three would be uh, where people walk from the destination zone to the center of where they're going to. It's an interesting visual conveying um, th this idea that uh, you may need to walk backwards, you know, to get to your train station or out of your way. And, and so maybe the network needs cycling infrastructure or walking infrastructure um, in, in the direction of, of the um, train station. OK, so the next layer of complexity in transportation is adding the built infrastructure. Uh, so there are. Uh, no doubt, roads and rivers and 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 all sorts of uh, say transit constraints and um, applying what we've just modeled to a real city really requires that we um, um, understand routes. So not just uh, multi-line string geometry with with the nodes we described before, but now with with vehicles turning corners or going around segments. Um, and OpenStreetMap has an interface to, to provide a turn-by-turn -turn, like event list to get from one place to another. Uh, obviously, the more detail provided in the model, the larger the file size. And with even this small model of uh, Bristol with 102 zones, the, the, the compute required can be pretty substantial. But we'll do a, a demonstration here with, um, um, with a, a very small set, subset to get, get, to get the idea of what's going on. Um, they're, they're, the authors break the approaches up into, th into three kind of uh, uh, systems uh, for routing. Um, based on you know, what you've got available for, for computing tools. The first one is in-memory routing. So in your R session on your PC, there's, there's a certain amount of work you can do with mapping routes and, and the capacity on routes. Um, there are also connections between R in memory and a program you have in memory that, that does the routing for you. So a, a handoff between R and some other software on, on, your, um, on your local computer. And then the, the say the third uh, routing um, uh, method 
is a remotely hosted service that um, it could be in the cloud with a with a dedicated API that that can give you the latest information or maybe even current information like current traffic information. Okay, so in this model, um, the authors point out that cycling is most beneficial when it replaces car trips. So if if we can add a cycling trip and eliminate a car trip, then, then we don't need to add any roads. It's, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's a net benefit in, in many ways. Um, so what they've done here is they've taken the desire lines and isolated specifically, um, there's, there's a way to measure the length of the desire line because we know the origin and, des and, and destination. So they, they, they come up with a distance in kilometers and then they um, filter for um, well, different, different constraints here, um, but specifically trips between looks like less than five kilometers and more than two and a half kilometers for this study. And we're calling those routes short. And we're going to bind the rows of our short desire lines with our routes, our cycling routes to make a map. Oh, and, and we've got to align them on the same CRS, recall from a past chapter. So I thought this map was really interesting. So we've got desire lines of where people want to go and short cycling routes superimposed on one another. So you can see uh, what, what cycling routes are useful to people uh, or um, you know, depending on the condition of those routes, maybe these are underserved populations. They note here in, in this just R based example, um, we can't be sure how many trips actually follow those routes. You know, just because someone said they were biking in the census doesn't mean they they actually do this. Um, but it still might be policy relevant in in highlighting like high likelihood trips. Okay, so the next step is route networks. Um, so in this case, we're, we're gonna make another modeling assumption. If, if we can assume as a policy objective that uh, we could target to replace 50% of the car trips between zero and three kilometers, um, if 50% if of the car trips could be replaced by cycling, and, and maybe that percentage drops by 10% for each additional kilometer of route distance so that 20% of car trips of six kilometers are replaced by cycling and, and none are at eight kilometers or longer, um, we could actually build a function <laughs> that, that assumes that and build a scenario uh, using this uptake function. In fact, this is a nice graphic of the function we just described. And let me think about this graph. How was it made? Okay, there was uh, this overline function and maybe I can find it in here in the transportation. As I recall, what, what this has done is shown um, the bike trips per day modeled in one direction that, uh, 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 that, would, that would be impacted or that would grow um, subject to this function. And I kind of wish the code block showed. 
Maybe we can come down to this. Here we go, yes. overline. So yes, route network scenario, overline route shorts scenario. So the, 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 say the model we built up there, we fed into the overline function and then built a, a, a GG plot of uh, line strings broken up uh, with the sum or the aggregate statistics for each route segment in the network. Did I describe that well, Olivia? Okay. Uh, I'll have to figure out why they did the code. I'll try to get that code block to show. Okay, so the, with the networks at the segment level, um, like if we know the road type and the width, uh, um, like in OpenStreetMap, we can um, we we can do a, a lot more detailed modeling. And Bristol Ways is an example of a, a data set that has um, that the the detail of the underlying inf infrastructure. So we can feed Bristol Ways into uh, uh, SF networks to keep the geometric attributes. Um, and in this case, we, we get an SF network along with an iGraph. Okay, and there's this concept of between this that I, did I mention it up here? Edge between this means the number of shortest paths crossing through each edge. So what this is showing is that um, As I understood it, this was cycling bonus potential. That is for, for that function where if our goal is to reduce car trips uh, per that function, these are the corridors along which uh, we get the most uh, benefit by uh, increasing cycling and, and thus reducing car trips. Yeah, you got it correctly. The betweenness is like the network jargon. I mean, it's the term like we determine like the shortest path. I know the short, the not the shortest path, the um, most uh, shareable path between the various uh, nodes. Like where are the nodes that share this most path? I think this is that. If I remember correctly, my graph <laughs> courses, but maybe like uh, Derek, like maybe. This is maybe more mathematic mathematician than <laughs> geographic. Uh, no, no further comment. <laughs> I think okay. uh, conceptually, this this model is making a lot of assumptions, but I I yeah. think I think I think you're right that um, uh, given this certain goal and this function, um, this this is. This is uh, a, a model output that that uh, it, you know articulates potential. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's it is also data. I just the model, but also the data. So it's it's just not the only the model. It also used like previous data to identify places that could be good place. After that, you can still go like. To the field and validate that i think this is just like i assume like planners use that then after they do like more specific survey so they can like validate what the models and the previous data they had will do and as also like currently like this does not provide any cost analysis but you can also i imagine adding that dimension like the price no 
I'm, I'm sure that function can be as, 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 as complicated as, as yeah. you want it to be. Absolutely. It's interesting to me, this, this is really derived um, at least originally from survey data, but if you had traffic counts or other sorts of daily activity, um, uh, uh, for example, in the train network, usually you have an idea of how many people are getting on the train and how many are getting off. Um, these models could be enhanced in in uh, many other ways. Yeah, and like it's a complicated chapter, also like imagine already. Yeah, so they get to the kind of the 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 bigger money question here. Um, in prioritizing new infrastructure. So somebody wants to spend an awful lot of money on, I don't know, locating a train station or, or um, uh, you know, making other investments. And um, in, in this example, um, what they do is they take the, the, uh, the Bristol Ways data set, with the uh, uh, roads and other things, and specifically look at cycleways, pull the geometries together into one big geometry, and then create a buffer. Um, and this takes a little while to run. Um, but um, well, and then make sure our CRSs are the same between our buffer and our route network scenario from above. But we could look at the difference between the, the scenario we had before and, and our buffer and specifically um, identify um, routes that could could be improved to support that that uh, 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 car reduction strategy. Obviously there's all sorts of limitations or um, uh, assumptions, and uh, probably the biggest one is people really don't travel from zone, zone centroid to zone centroid, and um, they often don't take the sh shortest route either. Maybe they stop at the supermarket or other places besides going to work. So um, it's it's um, it's uh, necessary to add those other layers of complexity, but, but doing so requires a lot of compute power. Um, okay, so um, they talk here in future directions about specific interventions. So these models are useful not so much because they're accurate every day, but you can set a baseline and then model the effect of an intervention. So given a certain change from baseline, what percent increase or decrease of our traffic on a certain road, for example, um, it's, it's possible given a model to change just one thing and understand the, the intervention um, maybe in terms of green, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, maybe in terms of, I mean, the question here is what are you optimizing for? But, but typically we can make a model and optimize and, 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 and speak to the difference for the parameter of, of or the metric of interest. Um, they mentioned including many more variables. I get the impression that's pretty common. They also mentioned um, in, in, in this space, there's a tool in the, called the propensity to cycle tool that's a publicly available mapping tool that um, in some ways uh, does this to prioritize investment in cycling across England. So, so these models have been built out with, with uh, with more parameters and made available to the public in a, as a as a website at pct.bike. Oh, 
Okay, moving on. That was 20 minutes on transportation. Now we'll do 20 minutes on geo marketing. Um, so here we're going to locate bike shops in Germany. Um, and we're going to think about not only where people they live, but where they spend their time and 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 uh, consume resources. And reality is humans tend to congregate in places where there's um, it, it, not uniformity, where there are economic niches, uh, land prices, uh, maybe youth oriented or arts oriented type communities. There's, there's a lot of diversity. And so the main task of this geomarketing exercise is to find out based on available data where um, optimal locations could be for specific services uh, and, and then maybe scout out those locations for further study. So typical questions in the marketing space uh, include where do the targeted groups live or, or maybe higher percentages of, of the population of interest. Um, where are your competitors? It's always good to have maps of where your competitor stores are. Um, how many people can easily reach this store? Um, do existing services, are, are they under or overutilized for what you would expect for the market potential in that zone? And, and even questions about market share um, could, could be answered using these tools. Okay, so in this case, we have an interest in, and this is a bad assumption, but we're gonna go with it, that our, our target audience is males 20 to 40. And, and if, if you make that assumption, well, given that affinity group, where should stores be placed? Um, we're really fortunate. Um, there's, um, there is government provided data, but I just downloaded the author's file. <laughs> um, there's a little bit of tidying required to, to translate to English, which is, which is nice in the, in the, in the code they provided. And, um, there's some negative values in there that are actually, um, NAs. So when we clean that up, we get a, a, a tidy data frame with raster coordinates. So these are X and Y grid coordinates um, where every point on the grid has a, a population parameter, a proportion of women, a mean age, and, and a, a size parameter that we'll get to. So in this case, um, X and Y in this sample file correspond to uh, a square, um, yeah, a square kilometer unit grid. We could put that Heidi um, data frame into Terra's RAST um, function with a CRS, and we get a fat raster file, and uh, summary of what's there, uh, you can see it's got min and max values for, for every one of the metrics or every one of the layers in that file. We're also going to go get um, a map of Germany, uh, country DEU, and um, convert that to an SF object. So using TM shape, we can plot each layer of the raster in a, in a T map. And uh, as you can see within Germany um, in, a, in a grid, the, the color of the point is the, the number or the say the class of, of the intensity of uh, each of the layers in the file. The HH is household size. Okay, the next step 
is we have to reclassify the values of the raster um, from that file in accordance with the, with um, say with the survey. Um, so we we'll go through an operation here um, where we uh, map these numbers to the, the middle of like population or percentage bins so that they can be joined. So we have to reclass um, the, the raster and there's a Terra classify function that makes that easy to do. At the end of the day, we, we get a spat raster back and you see the max and min values align with um, I mean, the data it, set we have. It's kind of no, uh, centralized now? Yeah, they're centralized on the, on the bins. Yeah. Okay, here we're also going to um, focus our study on uh, large metro areas. So just look at places with more than 500,000 people in a, in a uh, say a, a group of, of raster elements. Um, so with that filtered uh, metro area, um, uh, we can make that an SF object metros. In fact, we can add names. So I just used what the author did is he, he put the names in manually as a, as a vector here. And in a minute, we'll see how to get those through reverse geocoding, but we'll, we'll just do it the uh, hard coded way here and, and stick the names on the, on the centroids to see um, that yes, in fact, these are the major cities in, in Germany and the, the little squares represent the, the raster blocks in those metro areas. As a side conversation, they, they do say you could, um, you could send metros, uh, the centroids of the metros out to DMAP tools or reverse geocode OSM. And it will bring back city and state. Um, the cities come, came back looking pretty good. Um, although I think there was a comment that Velbert wasn't quite right. So um, we have to be careful when we do reverse geocode lookup because the format of the, the cities and the names, for example, I'm, I'm pretty sure Hamburg is, is uh, it's Launder is Hamburg. I'm, Pretty sure it's it's in its own state, and Berlin has a special district that may not be uh, exactly a lander, um, if I'm correct. Okay. So the next thing we can load in is points of interest, um, competitor shops, and and all sorts of other things that are interesting. To, to bikers and the o open street may or OSM data package provides ways to bring in an enormous amount of uh, interesting stuff to show on the same map. Um, he provides a friendly way of um, downloading every layer. And in fact, in this case, shops. Um, I didn't do this, it would be, um, Oh, two gigs of data. And then it gets filtered down by metro area. But rather than do that, I just grab the data file. <laughs> and uh, just for my own curiosity, I, I made a plot of that. And so um, the, the, uh, the shops in the data file seem to correspond with the major metro areas in Germany. Um, that spatial point object of interesting points of interest um, also needs to be converted. So we, we need to rasterize the, the, um, the, uh, the shops with the CRS from reclass from, from our other, uh, from the previous section. So we end up with this POI raster, the point, the, 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 the raster 
squares that have the most points of interest. Um, as with the other raster layers, the points of interest raster needs to be reclassified into four classes. Um, there's a judgment call that has to happen here too. Um, in this case, the authors choose to use, uh, they apply an algorithm called Fisher-Jenks that derives natural breaks um, so that we minimize the within class variance of the, of the points of interest, which provides an, an input for the reclassification matrix. So here's that matrix again for conversion and, and the input from the class intervals. And as before in the, in the last section, we run classify on the points of interest and we rename that POI and we get a SPAT raster again with points of interest for each uh, grid element between zero and three. All right, so what we're getting to really quickly here is there is a points of interest layer in this file. Uh, of course, we can sum the points of interest, uh, but even more interestingly, what we can do in a tool like map view, zoom, zoom in on a city, in this case, Berlin, we've projected the specific raster squares that are um, high potential, um, so Berlin raster over nine come out as green blocks. And these are the zones with the highest cycling store potential. Okay, in the last 10 minutes. Um, the book wraps up with a lot of ideas to bridge you to um, you know, your projects and other useful material. Um, as they did when they opened the book, they've got a comment here in the closing about choosing an approach. So packages like SF instead of SP perhaps, um, IDverse instead of base R perhaps, we've, we've talked about those things. Um, I thought it was useful here. They note that there is a spatial task view on CRAN it has an index of 160 packages, which can seem overwhelming. Their advice is to start by learning one approach in depth. So take a deep dive in one of them and try to have a general understanding of the relationship with, with other packages, because there's going to be some overlap. Yeah, an important point is do not feel like also overwhelmed, you know? Yeah. It's, it's fine to start somewhere. I, I, uh, I noticed in this book, not just in the conclusion, but throughout, they, they do mention other people's work, which I think is really generous of them. In 16.2, they, they uh, uh, for example, pointed out there's a geographic data science book specifically that you could go and read. It's also um, uh, open source online and available. And there are also courses or mini courses like this one from uh, Cornell that teach um, geospatial topics. Uh, they acknowledge here that big data has largely been omitted from this particular book. They encourage people to follow Apache Sedona, GeoParquet. Um, they didn't mention it, but when I hear about Parquet and in the R world, I also think about Arrow and I think there's a Geo Arrow initiative, but there are other ways with databases and other tools um, to build on your knowledge of, of, of handling um, large, large geospatial models. Some comments on getting help that are worth repeating. Um, to start from first principles, make a simple sketch, um, diagnose individual lines to make sure the Output is the, you know, what you expect, the class or the, the type of output. The docs are always available in R. Um, you could, after reading the docs, do a broader online search 
Stack Overflow and Google have been useful. And most recently, GPT-3 is there. But they're all built on people who generously asked the question in public and got an answer in public. And so you're, you're leveraging other people who had the same conversation. If that still fails, build a reprex, a reproducible, simplified answer, and ask in a forum. Uh, our R for DS is one. Um, but they also mentioned um, this book was actually the product of a, uh, a special interest group or a, like a Slack channel of, of geospatial uh, people. I didn't see it in my notes here. It's but a newsletters. I mean, not a newsletter, I, it's I, a mail letters. Mail, um, how do you call that? The mail. Um, you can subscribe. Yeah. It's a mailing list. Mailing list. <laughs> so I know there's a mailing list, but I think this GeoCompex community is, besides our open side, there's GeoCompex. And I, I believe this book was discussed in its infancy in that, in that community. Yeah. Um, lots of great resources. Um, oh, and then obviously, so demonstrating your efforts to solve a problem publicly, if, if that's out on a GitHub or in a Slack or somewhere, if, if that gets picked up, if it was on Stack Overflow, somebody else asking the same question should have the benefit of arriving at the same answer someday. So um, this, this pattern of us contributing is, is actually beneficial in, in so many ways. Um, they do mention where to go next. There's nothing wrong with uh, learning the, the, same, the similar sorts of concepts using Python or other languages. Um, they encourage people to look both from a, like a, a basic academic, like a teaching perspective, as well as some of the theoretical conversations, things about like, like spatial resampling or, or uh, some of the statistical concepts are, um, are still evolving and understanding the, the state of the art in theoretical perspectives is useful. Um, many, met met many methods have been written about, but not yet implemented in code. So, so learning about the methods and applications can be rewarding. Uh, a closing note on free and open source software then. Um, by writing code in a script, by putting it in, uh, you know, releasing it in a repo and GitHub, um, what we're doing is building on one another, and and there's a philosophy in free and open source solutions in the in the books here and in the packages that um, we encourage creativity by participating in free and open free and open source solutions. Um, in some ways, we discourage people from reinventing the wheel because we're we're using the state of the art software, and and we make research more conducive to what's happening in the real world with live data by en enabling anybody openly to access uh, our methods and apply them even in new areas. I like the comment that transportation, geomarketing, and ecology all overlap one another. They, they, they really are. The, the best practices apply to all three. It's, uh, they note it's more than a technical relationship. It's a community of people interacting daily with shared aims. Um, so we, we enable or empower learning, collaboration, and efficient division of labor. It's really instructive to watch the activity. Uh, like in GitHub, if you've not had the opportunity to submit an issue or even to write documentation for a package, um, take some time to do that. It's a real. Um, uh, uh, it's a, it's an important step in participating in this to um, you know to support the even the writers of this book in the next version of this book out on GitHub. And I think that's what I had for the hour. Hey, congratulations! Good job. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I guess we have like 
we can have five minutes to discuss a bit like the the chapters if some others like have like comments excellent breakdowns thanks Jim. yeah it was good yes thank you well done yeah well explained yeah i think it's yeah it's a it's like uh the conclusion was good also i think it's encapsulate like very important point like we can all contribute the same i will add the same with the data you can also contribute to open street map <laughs> uh and um, even like using the tool and like you do not understand something uh asking a question with like uh, like yeah with a reprex is a good way first to understand what you are not understanding by yourself like a lot of time when i not like be able to solve something i think there's a bug i do i build a reprex and then i usually solve my problem <laughs> because like uh, i was not uh, i was not thinking correctly i think so like the reprex is is a super i think it's a very important um uh, but it's also a bit hard uh, sometimes with the spatial data because you have a lot of reprex you choose like non-spatial data so most of the time for my reprex in spatial data i use like well-known um data sets like for example you can use like the most data sets there's plenty of them that's like the also like the um housing i don't remember in which cities in new york or whatever <laughs> there's a lot of common data sets that we all used uh, that we know exactly uh, a bit so it can also help you but yeah it's it's, it's uh, i think they provide fairly solid um um i don't know um recommendation <laughs> that's my take and Derek, what's yours what's what do you think about like the the, the two chapters and um the conclusion yeah i agree um i really appreciate um textbooks and other settings that really uh, help us understand like, where this is useful and uh, carry out a, a full analysis. And yeah, I'm still getting into our programming and hoping to feel more like an expert in the future. But as we endeavor in our own Slack channels, it's like you got to be able to make an example, show people exactly what you're looking for, if possible, and you get help much quicker that way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Tony, like you were a beginner at the beginning of the book. How do you feel now? Uh still still a beginner, but that's um, fine, you know. No, but I, I mean I've I've taken some minor wins from this. You know, I know I only did one chapter, but you know, getting that to actually publish was a was a big uh thing. That, uh, I know Derek put a lot to guide me. There was some help stuff out there that I wasn't aware of. And, you know, since then I've been, uh, you know, playing, playing with some other stuff and, you know, using Quarto and, you know, making some reports for work that, you know, um, use that reproducible format and, you know, basically something I have to do weekly that I've kind of turned into a Quarto report. So, you know, I, I've picked up a few things dabbling, uh, here and there, so, you know, keep keeping the, uh, the R learning uh, moving moving forward. Yeah, that's what's make make it also interesting. It's not necessarily being an expert right away, just like also yep. learning new stuff. And <laughs> yep, looking to sign up for a couple more book clubs. Uh, yeah, oh, that's cool. There's a couple others starting out there, or some other ones going on. And you know, it's hard to go back and watch all those old videos. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I agree. If you don't I dedicate the, the the time ahead of time and the one hour slot, you know, suddenly there's eight weeks worth of, you know, yeah. one hour YouTube videos and you're like, I'll just wait for the next one to start versus trying to. Yeah, it's good. Like, I think it's it's in. good also like to not binge do them. I don't know exactly. if it's the correct word. Like just, I'm following one book club at a time. That's my max capacity. <laughs> yeah, I think that's good. Good mantra. So but try 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 improving it but it's it's hard like there's a lot to learn and lots of new stuff which is interesting also yep and lots yeah of good I, stuff in, in here though yeah quarto is awesome like i'm starting also using it it's it's so great like yeah just 
it's yeah, it just simplify all the block down block. I mean, the whole uh, it was a very diverse <laughs> ecosystem, and it make it a bit more like yeah, yeah. centralized. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And well, and well, Jim, did you have like also like some other stuff to add? Nope, all good. This all good. is um, this, this is fun. I'm uh, so the last puzzle is is I I get the book to build. It writes the HTML files, and then there's one little cryptic error. It's sig pipe signal execution halted. <laughs> uh, that's and, fine. Like, it, it can uh, wait a bit. So I will get the YouTube videos from uh, John Harmon and uh, well, you have to tomorrow. End the, have tomorrow. To and, and and then 